Eli Rosenbaum is a hero to our community. He is a hero in the Cleveland community. He is a hero in the Jewish community. He is a hero in the law enforcement community. And he is a hero in our American community. Ladies and gentlemen, Eli Rosenbaum. also to thank my very good friends at the Robert H. Jackson Center who helped arrange my appearance here today. The Jackson Center is a living monument to one of the great figures of American history, indeed of world history, uh, former Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson. The worldwide impact of the Center's tireless work in, in furtherance of Justice Jackson's unique legacy in the realms of justice and human rights continues to grow by leaps and bounds. We, of course, at the Justice Department claim him as, as one of our own. He was the 57th Attorney General of the United States before being elevated to the Supreme Court and leading the American team at Nuremberg. The Nuremberg trial really was, was his, his brainchild in, in so many ways. And I especially want to thank Victor Gelb, who was clearly the, the moving force in making my appearance here today happen. The amazing uh, fruits of his decades-long leadership in philanthropy and civic activism on behalf of causes that debtor and even save people's lives are evident throughout the, the greater Cleveland area and well beyond. I challenge anyone in this room uh, or in the radio audience to name a major good cause that has not been supported by, by Vic Gelb and his lovely wife Joan. Uh, through their nearly endless good works, the Gelbs continue to help so many and to inspire people of good, goodwill all over the world. And just yesterday, by the way, uh, this wonderful couple celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary. Isn't that great? Yeah. Of course, the best known of the Cleveland, Cleveland area cases is that of John Demjanjuk, whom we deported to Germany in 2009 after nearly a decade of hard-fought litigation. Just last month, Demjanjuk was convicted of having served as an accessory to the murder of some 28,000 Jews at the Sobibor death camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. The case sort of came full circle because when originally tried in your beautiful city in 1981, the major factual allegations were that he uh, participated in Nazi-sponsored acts of persecution at both the Treblinka death camp and the Sobibor death camp. Well, the Sobibor charge stuck, as they say, and Demjanjuk was convicted. He was a guard at that infamous camp and at a number of other Nazi camps as well. The Munich court validated the evidence that, that we and our dedicated German colleagues had amassed against Demjanjuk over the years, and that's very gratifying. Demjanjuk's story is a 34-year saga of investigation and litigation on three continents, and time certainly doesn't permit me even to tell the tale in summary fashion. Fortunately, most of you are already familiar with it. By the way, many of you will recall that in April 2009, when we first tried to remove Demjanjuk to Germany, he claimed that he was too ill uh, and that his life would be imperiled by a transatlantic flight on a medevac plane that we had chartered for him. Uh, as shown uh, in video that the family shot, every time the U.S. government physician uh, touched him during a pre-flight examination, he cried out in pain. It was only when we introduced surveillance video that had been shot by our wonderful, brilliant colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement that showed Demyanya going to an appointment, walking, uh, talking uh, and even uh, 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 joking with people after he had had to be carried out on a stretcher in full view of the press from his home looking like he had one foot already in the grave. It was only then that the Court of Appeals in Cincinnati uh, uh, allowed us to remove him to Germany. You've all seen him on television and in the newspapers on trial in, in Germany. He's in a wheel, he was in a wheelchair, his mouth agape, again looking like, like uh, uh, he had one one foot at least uh, in the grave. What you haven't seen, because it's only been published uh, in Germany's largest newspaper, is the footage that they shot, the, 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 film, the, the, the photos that they shot, uh, shortly after Demjanjuk was released, following his conviction, released pending the results of his appeal, and once again, he's walking. There is no wheelchair, there is no assistance, there is not even a cane. Uh, Mr. Demjanjuk has, for many, many years, tried to make a mockery of the legal process uh, here and in Germany, and, and I would contrast uh, his behavior uh, with that of Sobibor death camp survivors, people like Thomas Blatt and Philip Bialowicz, who testified in the Munich trial with great courage and with great dignity. Of course, the, the so-called biological solution to the Nazi cases will soon bring these prosecutions to an end. 
However, there's much work to be done in cases of post-World War II human rights violations. Just as Nazi criminal, criminals fled to this country, so have perpetrators from other conflicts. With our colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, my agency has been vigorously pursuing justice in these cases as, as well. We can already point to major successes, among them the conviction in Florida of Charles Taylor Jr., the son of former Liberian President Charles Taylor, for acts of torture carried out in Liberia. This was the first ever prosecution of an individual under the federal torture statute. And, and following his conviction, he was sentenced to a 97-year term of imprisonment. His father, by the way, is currently on trial in The Hague. There was also the case of Bojo Yosefovic, prosecuted by our colleagues at ICE uh, in a deportation case, based on proof that my office amassed, establishing that Yosefovic committed mass murder of Bosnian Muslims during the violence that uh, followed the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. There's also the case of uh, Stephen Green, one of our own, uh, a former uh, army soldier in Iraq, who we proved raped a 14-year-old girl, Abir Qasam al Yanabi, and then murdered her and her entire family while he was serving in Iraq. Uh, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. So uh, the work continues in these important human rights cases, including our remaining World War II Nazi cases. Uh, I've often been asked, especially uh, with regard to the Nazi cases, why continue prosecuting these people, uh, especially the senior citizen defendants. Whatever they did before coming here happened long ago. Uh, they're not a threat to the public. They're not killing anybody anymore. Uh, not persecuting anyone anymore. Well, I mean, think there, there are many compelling answers that, that one could give. First, you know, we are, after all, enforcing U.S. law. Employing those same laws, uh, our government deports every single year many thousands of people, mostly to Latin America with Hispanic names, and mostly for the sole offense of being here without proper documentation. Would it not be hypocritical of our government to deport all of those people, but give a pass to others who violated U.S. immigration and citizenship laws after participating in human rights crimes. Uh, I'd also submit that those of the surviving victims uh, uh, who've made new homes in this country ought not be forced to share their adopted homeland with their former tormentors. And yes, instances have actually arisen in which vi surviving victims in this country have accidentally encountered their perpetrators um, in the United States. Uh, those surviving victims should no longer have to live in fear. This country has a proud history of offering haven to the oppressed, not sanctuary to the oppressors. The victims are entitled to see their country pursue justice on their behalf. Finally, though, uh, and arguably most important, it's imperative to continue pursuing these cases to send a strong message of deterrence. Would-be perpetrators of human rights crimes need to know that they will be pursued no matter how far they flee from the scenes of the crimes, even all the way to the United States, and that they will also be pursued for however long it takes, that even if they manage to avoid uh, detection into old age, they will still have to worry about the possibility of apprehension. I'd like to think that somewhere a potential participant in an atrocity will recall having once seen on television maybe a gray-haired war crimes defendant being hauled into court here or in Germany or somewhere else, and that he or she will decide, you know, it's not really worth the risk. I'm not going to participate. Uh, thus, through these cases, uh, we at the Department of Justice, I believe, uh, make a contribution to the worldwide effort to end impunity and replace it with a regime of accountability for human rights crimes, to realize the dream, really, of Justice Robert H. Jackson, beginning with his work at Nuremberg. This work is a high priority for Attorney General Holder, for Lanny Brewer, the head of the Justice Department Criminal Division, for Steve Delbach and other U.S. attorneys around the country, and of course for the women and men of the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, which is headed by an accomplished champion of justice on behalf of the victims of human rights, uh, human rights crimes, uh, Teresa McHenry. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And I look forward to taking your questions.